Amen. I thank the Lord myself for being here tonight. So far, it's been quite a week. Amen. But God has certainly, certainly been encouraging. If you open your Bibles to the book of 2 Thessalonians, chapter number 2. I would like to pick up and finish up on a thought from last week as we ended Bible class, which is about being hearers and not doers of the word, and how important it is to be a doer of the word, not just a hearer of the word. It doesn't matter if you sit in every Bible class that, that they have during the week, that the church has. It doesn't matter if you sit and read your Bible for half a day and listen to it being read the other half of the day. If you don't go do what it says, it doesn't matter. The, the world has an expression like this. There is a difference between theoretical knowledge and practical knowledge. In theory, things may sound one way, but in practice, it may be different. Does anybody know a scripture that seems hard to do that the scripture gives us, the Bible gives us? Yes, ma'am. Love your enemies. Does everybody in here love their enemy? Oh. All right, let me rephrase the question. Does anybody in here have any enemies? The, the devil? Well, I believe that that's an exception to the rule. We don't have to love the devil. There's a difference between someone being your enemy and someone getting on your nerves. And there are times when people will do things that we don't like and we'll say, we'll act like they're our enemy, but they're really not. An enemy works against you. There's a parable that Jesus used and he said the good man uh, or the, the man that owned the field went out and he sowed good seed. And the enemy came along and sowed tares among the good seed. So what that parable, one of the things it tells us is, is that an enemy does things to destroy you. An enemy does things to tear down what you're trying to build up. I don't think that many of us in here really have enemies. But it's easy to say, love your enemies. It's a different thing when you go out and look at your field and there's a lot of tares growing in that field, and you know it was your neighbor that did it. That's different. Now I got to love them? That's something that's more difficult. And loving someone isn't just a cliche like we often use. I love you, but I don't like you. That's... I've had saints argue toe-to-toe -to -toe with me. Oh, I, I love them. I don't like them. And I said, you can't do that. Yes, I can. I said, no, you can't love a person and dislike them. Yes, I do. Okay. We, we could stand here and argue all day. But the bottom line is we, we make room for wrong when we love somebody. If I... She said, I love you, but don't like your ways. Is that the same thing? That's kind of like the, I love the sinner, but not the sin. I'm not so sure that we're able to really distinguish a lot of times the difference. Because I can't think of the name of the church. There's a church that goes around and protests military uh, when the soldiers are coming back and they... I'm glad that you're dead and that kind of thing. And, and if you talk to them, I've seen them being interviewed on TV, and they'll say, we love the person. It's the sin that they're in that we hate. Well, if, you, if that's the case, then do you go to your own family's house and protest against them like that? It's very difficult for us to separate between the sinner and the sin because if we could do that, we wouldn't get into so many petty arguments like we do we would realize, well, that's not you talking, that's the enemy. 
And how do I fight the enemy? On my knees. Yeah. He said, the Lord rebuke thee. You don't fight against flesh and blood, but we fight against flesh and blood. We do. Say that. Say. She said, the Lord used the word against Satan. Yes, he did. But I'm not so sure. Now, and, and let me be clear, all right? I'm not sure we even know how to do that. Because we'll get nasty with them with the word. I think sometime the best thing for us to do, shut up and pray. I'm not disagreeing that you can throw the word on somebody. But are you mature enough to throw the word on them and not be nasty about it? That takes something too. I can't remember where the scripture is. I was just talking with someone and we was looking at a scripture where it says, if any offend not in word, he is perfect. And something I can't. In the book of James chapter 4, I think it's 4. Let's see real quick. Get your Bibles real quick. Go to the book of James. Well, don't go real quick. I don't want you to pass it. No, it's not 4. It's 3. Verse number two, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able to do what? You know why he can bridle his whole body? Because he got his tongue under control. I think some of us would be quick to do the nasty little going up to someone and tell them, because y'all correct me if I'm wrong. Well, God bless you. I'm praying for you. Yes. Just, we'll say it nasty and mean. Sometimes it's better to, Lord, help me. So, to answer your question, sister, the, the truth of the matter is we should hate the sin and love the sinner. But I think that's a very difficult challenge for us to master. It's very difficult for us to separate the sin from the sinner. And the best thing, I think the safest and wisest course of action is to just pray. And if you can't pray for them, pray for you. Ain't no point in you going to hell because you can't get over something somebody did. And you're so busy praying on somebody that you can't even realize you got a problem too. Well, since I'm kind of in a saints meeting mode. Even when we pray for people that we don't care for, we have to be careful how we pray for them. I use this example maybe too much, but I think it is the, the best example of how to treat your enemy that there is in the Bible. And that is how Jesus dealt with Judas. When Jesus sent the 12 out to preach, he sent Judas with him. Did you think that Jesus for one second didn't realize what Judas was all about? He knew, didn't he? But he still treated him fair. All the way up until Satan entered into him. Jesus treated him fair. After Satan entered into him, Jesus still called him his friend. He treated the man right. We will sit down, if we're not careful, we will sit down and pray for God to get folks fired from the job because they no good, no way. They lazy. They always stirring up stuff. We'll pray for the Lord to, to get rid of them. They got a soul. How can someone be one to the Lord when we always praying away to ones we don't like? I think it was Jesus that used, that said, um, 
that a wicked man will give good things to his children. A corrupt, a bad father will give good things to his kids. So if the only ones we're concerned about getting saved is the ones that we like, what have you done special? I haven't done anything special, have we? Some of us, before we got saved, were some humdingers. Oh, we were some bad fellas. Now, thank the Lord, I, <laughs> I was bad too. I was 14 and bad, already bad. Ducking and running from the police, 14 years old, running from the police. I, it wasn't because I was out doing anything really bad, but if I'm running from them, it's because I broke the law. I hadn't hurt nobody, but I was still wrong, still in sin, still doing wrong. Amen. Got away, too. <laughs> Just want y'all to know that. See, even before I got saved, the Lord was helping me. No. I, I, I'm teasing about that. I did get away, but I, I got jumped on real, real bad. Real, real I got scared. Hey man, the man's house that I went to when I was running from the police, he threatened the police and made them leave. And when the police left, he said, if you ever come to my house again, running from the police, I'll kill you. And now let me just say this. I believed him. He ain't alive now. But to this day, I believe he would have killed me. For real. He scared me good. I thought afterward maybe I would have been better to be caught by the police. <laughs> we, we have to learn to put the word into practice. What does putting the word into practice do to us? Sometimes it shames us. Because sometimes somebody will tell you off and the devil, the day someone tells you off, you ain't no good at comebacks, but that day the devil give you a perfect one. Smoke them in front of everybody. Just tear them up. The, the, the devil will whisper a good comeback in your ear. And you have to sit there and be quiet. That's hard. That really is. It's hard when you know you ain't wrong to let somebody else look like they right. That's hard. When Jesus was being tried and they were questioning him, what did he say in his defense? Pardon me? Nothing. Was he wrong? Nope. Did he deserve what they was doing to him? Well, why didn't he just tell them, y'all wrong and you're going to pay for that? He said he was led dumb like a sheep to the slaughter, but why didn't he let them know something before they let him away? He could have. He could have still went to the cross and, and still told them, y'all going to pay. He could have done that, couldn't he? Exactly. She said, what kind of example would that have been? It would have been the example that flesh needed to run wild. It would have. Look, even Jesus did it. Now, we'll quote the Bible when it gives us permission to do something that make us feel good. And I, I, I just let them know. because, And then we'll quote a Bible scripture from the Old Testament when we're being mean. But the moment we get in trouble... We started looking for New Testament scriptures. Love your enemy. Don't judge. We, we, we do all kind of stuff. Look for all kind of scriptures to, to make room for us when we've done wrong. But when somebody else does wrong, oh, them bad little kids. The Bible, you know, they better be glad this ain't Old Testament because the Bible says stone them. Let the parents be the first to stone them. Oh, we just get harsh and nasty then. Second Thessalonians chapter two. Verse 
Verse number seven, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now the word let in old English meant to hinder. If you go get a dictionary from, I think it's the 1812, Webster 1812 dictionary, the word let means to hinder or to hold back. So, what he's saying here is, the mystery of iniquity or lawlessness, rebellion, that's what iniquity is, rebelling against what you know is right, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now hindereth will hinder until he be taken out of the way. Who is hindering the devil right now? The Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is what hinders right now. Now, I'm getting ready to give you all something for free. For those that think that we're going to go through the tribulation, watch this. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose, even him whose coming is what? After the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. He's talking about the man of sin. This is during the tribulation. Now, he won't even be revealed until he who hinders is taken out of the way. So if you're going to go through a part or all of the tribulation, you won't have the Holy Ghost no more. He's taking it out. Why do you think the devil will have so much control at that time? He's going to tear this world apart. Now consider this, during the tribulation, there are, the world's population right now is, I think, six or seven billion, somewhere around there. By the time we get to the end of the tribulation, only 20% of the world's population will still be here. A fifth will remain. That shows you what the devil will do if God doesn't block him. All he seeks to do is to kill, steal, and destroy. That's all he wants. He's coming with all power and signs and lying wonders and with what? All deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. The ones that are going to die, the ones that are going to perish, he is fooling them with signs, lying. What? Now, now, what is a wonder? Does anybody know what a wonder is? It's a miracle. He's going to perform miracles. And you can see that in the book of Revelations. It says he deceived them through, the miracle, through, through miracles. So, He's going to fool them through signs and wonders, through miracles and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. He is doing a lot of that right now. People right now are being deceived through unrighteousness. And in, in all fairness, I'm not trying to tell people they're in sin for watching TV, but we should be careful what we watch on TV. That television is programming us. It is persuading people that wrong is right. If this church went out and started giving out $10 bills to all the poor, you might see it on the local news. But if this church went out and held up signs that, it's a, that homosexuality is a sin, we'd be on CNN. They are programming us to what is important and what is not? What is really sinful and what is not? What is righteous and what is unrighteous? They're doing that. And we'll walk away scratching our heads thinking, 
maybe, you know what, that, that does make some sense. Well, yeah, you know what else makes sense? For in the day you eat thereof, you shall be as gods, doing good and evil. Didn't that sound good? Was it a lie? Oh, no, that was true. The only lie was, you shall not surely die. All they have to do, if I can say it this way, if ABC News is your channel to watch news, all they have to do is persuade you that they're honest and fair, level-handed, and unbiased in the reporting. If you can believe that lie, anything else they tell you goes down easy. All the devil had to do was convince Adam or convince Eve of the lie. The rest went down easy because it was true. I've said this before. I'll say it again. Keep on saying it. Almost nothing you see on TV is for real. Not the news, not the documentaries, not the television shows. Even the, what do they call them programs? Reality TV. Reality TV ain't real. How are you going to get into an argument with somebody and then while you're in the middle of arguing, they pop up a thing and shows you discussing what you was arguing about, then they go back to your argument. That ain't real. Those folks may start saying something and the, and the producers will come back and tell them, drill in on that a little more. Hammer, hammer, hammer away to, uh, I saw that you was angry. We need to see more anger. They tell them that kind of stuff. And then they come right back in and now they hot. They, they really going to show off for the camera. You know why? Because they don't want the show canceled. They want to come back next season. It's all fake. It's all put on. And we have saints that will watch some of that stuff and think, wow. Whew, I wish I had a house like that. But they had to do all kind of bad stuff to get that. Ooh, I wish if I could, if I had that kind of clout where I could just walk into a restaurant and snap my fingers and they find me a table. They'll put somebody out to make sure I got a table. We're impressed with that kind of stuff. And yet the scripture tells us to take the low seat. But they have persuaded us that this is the kind of lifestyle to have. How did he fool them? He performed miracles. Now, here's how they got themselves, because when you really think about it, how does a person go from being saved to being deceived? Do you know? All right. Well, let's read on a little bit further. With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because... They receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Some people don't want truth. They want to feel good. They want you to make them feel better. They want you to make them feel okay with God. But they don't want the truth. I was looking at a video clip today of a preacher just as off. Off. Stuff they were saying goes against scripture. But how do people get deceived? How do, how do people get into that condition? Because they receive not the love of the truth. I'm going to say this. I got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven brothers in here. I might be able to get out without getting stoned. Let me tell you something that television has done to the family structure, to the home. Yeah. If you watch television and you look at the commercials, the husband is just one of the bumbling kids now, and it's the wife that has everything under control. It's the wife that's running everything. Yeah. She's the level-headed person, and the husband just one of the kids. They've turned the family structure completely upside down. Scripturally speaking, and don't be angry with me, 
Scripturally speaking, it's not a 50-50 proposition when you get married. Wives, obey your own husband. You don't hear that no more. Television is telling us it's not like that. That's not real. The, the, for a wife to submit herself to her own husband, that ain't reality. And here's what, here's what sisters will come and say to me. Well, what if he's no good? Well, you should have thought about that. What if you go out and sign up for a mortgage that's going to cost you $1,000 a month and you make $700 a month and they give you the loan? You can't come back later and say, hey, that ain't fair. You should have counted up the cost. I saw when this collapse took place eight years ago, when we were really heading down, they were interviewing people who were losing their homes. This woman and her husband were both bus drivers, bought an $800,000 house. Some lending institution gave them a loan for $800,000 and they both school bus drivers. They was stumped. Why are we losing our house? The government ought to bail us out. No, you should have thought of that. When you signed on the dotted line, you knew it was going to cost you more than both of your incomes together. You knew that. You can't come back crying foul. If you are a sister and don't want to be told nothing, don't get married. That's all. Stay single and be your own boss. If you are a brother and don't want the responsibility of taking care of your home and helping to raise your children, don't get married. Be like the Apostle Paul. Accept that gift of celibacy. It bothers me to see men not spending time with their children trying to get out of paying child support when the, when, the, when the marriage goes bad. How can I get up out of this? I'll tell you how you get out of it. Get another job. Pay what you owe. Them are your children. You don't pay the state. You're paying for what you did, what you helped make. How does it become the woman's responsibility to take care of the financial end of raising children and you had a 50-50 part in that? All right, I'm going to leave it alone. If you know the truth and you love the truth, you can make it. When you love someone, you're willing to go through all kinds of things with them. Somebody had a song out, When a Man Loves a Woman. Who was that? Percy Sledge. When a man loves a woman. And he talked about, he talked about all the stuff. He would go through when a man loves a woman. You can't say you love the word, but I'm not going to put up with it. Oh, no, no, no. You can't say I love the Lord because if you go back to John 1 and 1, in the beginning was the word, right? And the word was with God. And the word was God. So you can't say, I love Jesus, but I don't like what the Bible says. Uh, all right. You can't say, I love Jesus, but I don't come to Bible class. How can you do that? We go to what we love. I love my grandchildren. When we don't have church, I go to the games. But I love this more. Yeah. And I'm not saying you in sin for going to your children's games. I'm not saying that. But you've got to know where to draw the line, too. You might not be able to make it to all of them. But you can still show your love and support. But listen, this is more important. 
if the doctor told you that you had cancer and was dying and you had to get one of your cancer treatments during one of the games, would you tell them, I'm sorry, we have to do that next week because uh, Pookie is playing volleyball tonight or soccer tonight? Will we do that? No, you know what we'd tell them? We would say, I'm so sorry, honey. I'll be at your next game, but I got to go to the doctor tonight. Wouldn't we do that? When you love the word, what won't you do for the word? You do whatever. So the reason why they were not saved is because they didn't love God himself. They didn't love the word of God, which is God. Verse 11, for this cause, God shall send them what? Strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Don't let nobody fool you with this business of God's unconditional love. Don't worry, baby. He loves you. You keep on cutting up. You keep on acting wrong. You keep on snubbing your nose at God. You keep on fighting against his word. He said, I'll send you a strong delusion so that you will believe a lie and be damned, so that you cannot be saved. Once God messes with your mind, how do you undo it? You can't fix what God has. Once he's made something crooked, you can't make it straight. You can't do it. Once God makes you think you're right, you'll sit right up in Bible class. Smiling. Oh, I, th I sure hope brother so-and-so's listening to that. Did you hear what he just said? Whoo, he's stepping all over her feet. Not, not when you love the word. When you love it, you're eating it. I love bacon. Love me some bacon. That's my favorite food. I love some bacon. And when I come to the breakfast table, I'm not sitting around saying, I sure hope my wife got some bacon. I sure hope so-and-so got some bacon. I sure hope my, ooh, that bacon was cooked right. I sure hope mama got her some. You know what I'm doing? I'm trying to hide it. I sure hope they didn't see there was three more strips of bacon left. Because I want it. When I love the word, I'm not coming here trying to dump it off on somebody else. I'm trying to eat some of my own self. All right, all right. For this cause, God shall send them strong delusion. What cause? For what cause? For not loving his word. You don't love the word? That's enough for God to send you a strong delusion. That's enough to make God turn his back on you. And once he has, I think it's in Philippians, it says it's both his to will and to do his good pleasure. You don't have a will to be saved. You don't have a will to serve God just because you somehow in your mind you figured it all out. It's his to will and to do. He's got to give you the desire and the ability. All he has to do is just take your will away. And that's it. You'll turn, walk away, and never come back and not even think about it again. That's all he's got to do is just take your desire from you. He doesn't have to smote you and knock you down, cover your body with boils and from head to toe, make everyone hate you, no one ever want to hire you. He didn't have to do all of that to prove that, that he's through with you. All he's got to do is just remove your desire to be saved. That's all. And you will never think nothing about God again. First John chapter 5. Another, first John chapter 5, another sin. Verse 17. All unrighteousness and sin. And there is a sin not unto death. What is righteousness? 
Does anybody know what righteousness is? Being in a right standing with God. Living holy. Let me, let me kind of encapsulate what you both have said. Come up with a simple definition. Righteousness is right living. That's all. Just living right. What's unrighteousness then? Not living right. When you know what is right and you don't do it, that's not right living, right? Yeah. All right. All unright living is sin. If you know that thumping your brother upside the head is a sin, and you say, but he made me mad, it's still wrong living, isn't it? If you thump him upside the head. <laughs> you, now, Deacon, you ain't got to move your head forward. He's not going to thump you. I've already, I've already thrown that out there now. <laughs> Some people make salvation nothing but a list of negatives. It's just... Well, now, what do, what do you have to do to be saved? Well, you got to stop smoking. You got to stop drinking. You got to stop fornicating. You can't lie no more. And if you've been stealing on your job, because I know you work at Walmart, if you've been stealing, you got to stop stealing. That's what they think salvation is. It's a list of a bunch of stuff we don't do. Salvation is positive. I am saved because Jesus shed his blood for me. I am saved because someone redeemed me from the hand of the enemy. Matter of fact, doesn't the Bible say, let the redeemed of the Lord say so? What are we saying? We're saying that he redeemed me from the hand of the enemy. We're saying there was a time when I couldn't help myself, but now look what God has done for me. Look at the power that God has given me. Look at the change he's made in my life. That's what salvation is. It's not, I'm saved. Really? What do you do to get saved? Well, you got to stop all these different things. That's not what salvation is. I walk in harmony with God because I love God. I serve him because I want to please him. I'm not trying to manipulate God out of something. I don't serve God because I might get an inheritance. Some folks are nice to old people because they might get something from them. They might get left something in the will. That's not the reason to be nice to people. Some people serve God because they might get something from him. It's always that hope that he's going to come through at that last minute for me. That's not why you love God. We love him because of the price that he paid that you should have had to pay, that I should have had to pay. If I wanted to be right with God, I should have had to die for it. But he said, I'll tell you what, I'll take your place. You know, there was a man who was having a seizure and he fell into the subway thing track when the train was coming. And this other man jumped down in there and held the man down until the train passed over. He saved his life. Now, how would it look for that man to get up and tell him, don't put your hands on me. Who do you think you are trying to hold me down? That's what we do to God. He sacrificed his life for us, and we will stand up and say, don't tell me what to do. Who does God think he is? Now, we won't say it in those words. We've come up with nice ways of telling God off. I don't see it like that. Well, I don't care what anybody says. God's going to have to show me. Oh, yeah, we, we'll get cute with God. Well, I'll tell you what he said. Yeah, he'll show you, but let me just be clear. He don't have to. He already showed us. He don't have to show us another thing. If God let the rapture happen this moment, 
He got enough for his kingdom. He got enough for what he wants. If not another person gets saved in the next 10 years, God already got enough for what he wants to do. Yep. So he doesn't have to prove anything to us. If anything, we should be trying to prove something to him. Show him how much we love him. Show him how much I appreciate what you have done. What is it too difficult to ask for someone that just saved your life? There's not much you could ask for. If, a, if that man that was on that train that had fell in there, that, had the, uh, that was, fell down in the tracks, if he had been a multi-billionaire, what could the man ask for that saved his life that that man would have told him no? If he'd have come up and said, look, man, I saved your life, and all I would ask is, could you buy me a new car? You think the man would tell him, oh, no, can't do that. You think he would do that? I'm sure he'd buy him a car, a house, and, and anything else he needed. Give him a nice little bank account, set him up with whatever he wanted. That's for saving a life. How much more a soul? All right. First John chapter 3. Let's look at the original, the originator. You know, little Richard used to say, I did that first. No matter whatever, whatever, whoever did something, little Richard would always come out, I did that first. Well, let me show you who did it first. First John chapter 3, verse 6 says, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Now, whosoever abideth in who? In Christ. Sinneth doesn't say that they don't sin, because sometimes saints will mess up, yeah. and we get ourselves up, yeah. and we get ourselves right with God, yeah. and we stop. Because the Bible does tell us, whoso confesseth and forsaketh shall be forgiven. You can't sin and then just say, well, there was a, there was a movie out that Alan Alda was in. It was just him and one other person. And the name of the movie was, I think the name of the movie was, Same Time Next Year. Par pardon me? No, it wasn't Carol Burnett. Each year, they, would both, they, they went on vacation and accidentally ended up being in a cabin together. They, they had booked it, double booked it. And the first, the first uh, week that they was there, they fussed at each other and carried on. But then they kind of made peace and friends with each other, and they decided we'll do it the same time again next year. Well, they had an affair. They was doing all kind of wrong. Once a year, they would get together and do wrong. You can't do God like that. You can't do wrong and then say, well, I ain't going to ever do that again unless or until. You can't do that. As long as my girlfriend don't come back to town, I am not going to cheat on my wife again. You, you can't. Don't do that the first time. <laughs> don't tell somebody off and say, as long as they don't bother with me no more, I ain't going to do that again. That's not the way saints behave. All right. Whosoever abideth, whosoever lives in him does not continue in sin. Whosoever sinneth, the person that just won't stop, hath not seen him, neither known him. You can't say that I know Jesus, I know God, I know the scriptures, I know my Bible, but I'm in sin and won't quit. You can't say that. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. The man that wants to do right, the man that's living right, is living right, even as God is right. However, now let's look at the other side of it. 
He that committed sin has just got a bad temper. He that committed sin just is struggling with their flesh. No. He that committeth sin is of the devil. For the devil sinneth after the Lord made him. From the beginning he was wrong. He was the originator of sin. He was the second highest in the universe, in the whatever verse. There was no higher than him. No higher than Lucifer. He was the bright morning star. He wasn't the lily of the valley though. He stood in the presence of God. He beheld the glory of the Lord. And somewhere along the line, he said, I want more than this. Who made him do that? He did. He did that. He decided, I don't want what God has for me. I want more. I don't want to be second. I want to be equal to the first. He didn't say over, and that's a good point. He, he, he didn't. He really didn't say that. He said, I will be like the Most High. He knew he couldn't be higher than someone that was everything anyway. But I can be equal to it. Oh, he, yeah, he had a real ego. He had a serious problem. Yes, sir. Why was he called son of the, why, he, the question is, why was he called son of the morning? Because of how beautiful he was. He was, he was in the book of Isaiah, I believe it is the 14th chapter. It's 14 or 24. Uh, 14th chapter, and we'll start at verse 11. Thy pomp is brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials. The worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. Now that's a pretty nasty condition to be in. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? How did you fall? How did this disgrace come upon you? How did you become so vile? Because you have said in your heart, he didn't just say it, he said it in his heart. I will ascend into heaven. Now that tells us something, that God had stationed him somewhere and he didn't want to be there. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Who are the stars of God? Angels. I will sit on or sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. And if you look in the book of Psalms, he talks about the throne of God being in the mount of the, of the congregation in the sides of the north. So he's saying I will sit where God sits. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. Oh, he must have been here. I'm not satisfied with this. And then I will be like the Most High. He was not satisfied. Go to Ezekiel. He was not satisfied with what God had given him. He wanted more. Now, where is the warning to us in that? If God calls you, and I'm going to just use this as an example because it's not a called position, but I don't want to ruffle nobody up and have them uh, mad when they walk up out of here tonight. If God calls you to be an usher, be the best usher 
you can possibly be. Don't sit around mad saying, well, I could be a better church cleaner and then try to underhandedly get the church cleaner fired so you can have the job. Be satisfied with what God calls you to. Let me, let me say this. I would like to be more sometimes than what I am right now. But I'm happy with what God has given me because I know I have limitations. And God knows I have limitations. Don't think I'd be so good pastoring a church of 2,000 people. That takes a decent kind of business mind to, to do something like that. And I don't have it. How would it look if I'm trying to under, undermine people so I can get their church? Preachers do that kind of stuff all the time. They'll come in and start trying to subvert members. And the pastor not really doing, if I was the pastor, you know who did that? Uh, David's son. Um, starts with an A. Absalom. Oh, a Absalom was a clever fella. David kicked him out. Then he had mercy on him. What does Absalom do? Starts winning the favor of the people, standing in the door. Well, now, if I was the king, I would, sh I would do this for you. Until he was able to, to have a full-scale coup and try to take the kingdom away from his dad. David was on the run for a while over that. There are some people who cannot be satisfied with what God has given them. And if I have to do, use trickery, if I have to use deceit, whatever, I'll use it to get what I want. Who are they acting like? The devil. That's exactly what he did. In the book of Ezekiel, maybe it's 28. Um, yes, Ezekiel chapter 28. And starting at verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till lawlessness, iniquity, was found in thee. Verse 16, By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy, of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings that they may behold thee. He was so pretty. I don't know what they call it now, but I remember they used to call girls that was cute. Oh, they think they a dime piece. Yeah. yeah. L Lucifer thought he was a dime piece. That's a 10. For, for those that want to go back to the 70s, they're a 10. Are you with me? Are oh, you with me now? All right. Remember that movie with Bo Derrick, 10? And she was not even pretty. But that's a different Bible class altogether. <laughs> Satan was beautiful. Now, consider this. The moon doesn't have its own light, does it? It reflects the light of the sun. But Lucifer, he had his own brightness. He was special. He really was. You can downplay him all you want, but he was really special at one time. The Bible talks about the music that was in him, the, the pipes and the tabrets and all the beauty that he had. He was a musical creature. That's why we have so much problems with music today. Always have. 
you can be very devilish with music. But who's the originator of it? The devil. And it's done got up in the church. By reason of thy beauty, you was lifted up. Because of your brightness, you got beside yourself. We got people right now that can't be saved because they're too cute. Seriously. They're just too cute. I'm not, I, I got people trying to call me. I can't be sitting up in church. Are you serious? I mean, I got men beating my door down. We was talking uh, Monday with some folks from, that was originally from around Castle. We were just reminiscing and going over some history. And he said, there was a woman here at one point. She was very beautiful. And a couple of guys got into a fight with her, uh, got in a fight over her, and was and had a gunfight, shootout, uptown, here in Cass, over some woman. And this wasn't back in the 1800s. I think this was in the 70s. They was, oh, they was, they was getting busy all over some woman. She was pretty. Some, some folks think they're cute like that. But you know what? We'll, we'll if you allow, we'll help you keep on getting older. Mole cheeks get to sagging. <laughs> that nose that was once just all cute and dimply will swell all up. All right, I'm going to stop right at the face. But y'all know, I mean, age will do some things to you. Some folks will go stand right in the mirror and get to grinning, doing all like this. You 90 years old, tired as you want to be, still thinking you looking cute. You know who does that? The devil puts that stuff in their mind. The devil makes them think you're too pretty to have to take this. There are some women who's too pretty to get tickets. Oh, they'll tell the police. You can't give me no ticket. Just go get on YouTube and look it up. Oh, they got them on there. Oh, they're just too cute. Salty if they get a ticket because they're too pretty for that. When you get to that point where you can't serve God because of you, you are already wrong with God. And it's not because of that. That's just the symptoms of what is really wrong with you. From whence, from whence cometh contentions among you? Cometh they not even of your lust? Or your pride, rather? Cometh they not of your pride? It's because you're thinking too much of yourself. That's why. That's why you can't get along with each other. Not, I'm not talking to you all. I'm talking to you all. I'm talking to you all out there in YouTube land. The reason why we have so many fights is because folks feel like, I don't have to take that. I don't have to have you tell me that. Who do you think you, don't talk to me like I'm a child. Ooh. That used to be my thing. Don't talk to me like I'm a child. I get mad. But you know what? The Lord worked that out of me. Does it still get me upset? Yup. But you know what I've learned? Just shut up. Like they used to tell us when we was little kids. Y'all shut up in color. <laughs> I've learned to shut up in color. I had a man talk to me like he owned me. Oh, the Lord worked that out of me because I needed a job. And he let that man dog me. He talked about me, talked at me, talked through me, but never talked to me. And I, I would get up in the morning having to, knowing I had to go to work, my stomach would be hurting because I didn't want to have to go face this guy. But I learned some things. I learned how to shut up in color. I did. You want to be saved? Man, the Lord will let you go through some things to work out of you what doesn't need to be in there.
And if you love his word, you'll do it. You might not enjoy it, but you'll do it. Because I want to please him. All right. Any questions? Anything? Yes, ma'am. She's requesting prayer for a man named John that she met at the doctor's office who's having um, surgery to repair or replace a pacemaker that he has that's gone bad. And to pray for him that the Lord give him a second chance. Amen. Everybody needs a second. Some of us needed three, four, and five, and six. I'm, I, I know I needed a, at least a dozen. Amen. But I'm, I'm sure grateful that uh, he helped me straighten that out before I run out of my chances. What I'm not anxious to do is go out and do wrong. All right. Anything else? All right. Stand on your feet.